Okay, thanks for making it to Veterans Daily with Jay and Clay. We're glad you made it. We are in November of 2024. For those that do not know, because just in case you watch this later on, but I am super, super excited to hear Clay tell us what we're going to be talking about today. Because <laughs> as as as, uh, as many things have went on this month, um, I'm just you know it's good it's good to see you, Clay. Um, you look just ravishing. Uh, looks like you got some beauty sleep. Thank God. And uh, now here we are. So please hit the thumbs up, subscribe, share with a friend, all that good stuff. We really appreciate it. Let's let's try to hit the 20,000 subscriber mark by January. That'd be great. Get your friends to, to sign up, send it out to your American Legion, your DAV, your PVA, your Order of the Purple Heart, your Marine Corps League, your Treya, your MOA. I could keep going on and on. So a VFW. So with that, I'll kick it over to you, Clay. Lead us in to what we're going to talk about today and i'm going to preface it with this please watch this whole video don't just hear four words comment and leave yeah. listen to all of the words because we're going to do a little bit of i don't know deepish diving and explanations on some things all right jump into it clay I'm glad you preface it that way because this is a topic that will we're gonna have those who are fully support what we say, and we're gonna have those who want to stone us and drag us outside for everyone to see, right? And we're gonna be talking about a Trump VA. What does that look like in 2025? Um, really for the next four years. And there's four topics I think we can segment this in, Jason. It's gonna be one, we have to talk about Doug Collins, who's the VA secretary um why is he buddies with trump what does that look like that background on how he got the va secretary spot that's going to clue us in on the second topic actually which is privatizing va healthcare. now it's not a complete privatization it's like supplemental kind of like the mission act and community care and food for thought i know someone's going to say it the mission act started in that obama era um trump kind of doubled down made some changes and now we have the mission act and community care that way if veterans are waiting 31 days for their appointment i think it's 30 they can now have access to community care so we're going to be talking about supplementing privatizing va health care um supplement is the key word there the last two topics jason are going to be really really big deep topics and that is the the vivek ramaswamy and elon musk conversation about the department of government efficiency right whatever it is that they want to call that which means cutting federal agencies i can personally speak on this one as a federal employee because my agency is going through a restructure and it falls within the positions that are not authorized but are funded and that's what they're talking about here so that's that's good news for me and my coworkers, right and then we have um the last topic is probably the one that everyone wants to know most is va disability what does that look like under a trump va and so jason just to dive right into this you know i'm a, I'm a rip the band-aid off type a type of person um looking at doug collins okay i will say this i i am glad to have representation from jd vance as a marine an nco at that and i'm glad to have representation of the post 9 11 era as the vice president and doug collins he did deploy to iraq he's currently a chaplain from from, from what i see and uh his heyday doug collins's heyday was really defending trump during the whole you know russian thing I guess if you want if you want to dive into that, that's fine. But VA related, um, he also supported privatizing VA healthcare with that supplemental of the Mission Act. And so I think if we're going to connect the dots, that's probably where Trump and Doug Collins fall within the most when it comes to VA. Give us your two cents on Doug Collins. All right. So uh, I think that that you're right on part of the pick aspect was yeah that was the, um, that was Trump, so Trump field. <laughs> Trump feels as though this is somebody that he could trust, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and hopefully that's a two way street. You know, he feels as though Doug Collins can give him the information that he needs, and he could trust that. Uh, and and he also knows that the direction that he wants will somehow, some way, kind of be implemented, right? It is a cabinet position. This is in the executive branch. 
let's yeah. not uh, let's not forget that you know the 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 VA secretary works for the president. So um, that's just the way it's set up. So Doug Collins first was in the Navy uh, for a couple years as a chaplain, active duty, got out, and then 9-11 uh, happened, and he joined back up into the reserves. I commend that already because I think that anybody, it speaks to somebody's character, right? If you already served and you got out, and then something like 9-11 happens, and you raise your hand again, there's a character thing there. And, and I'm all about that because it's the actions of people that we can kind of um, uh, base things on, right? So I don't know a lot about Doug Collins. I did a video on him on, on my channel. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have, or you're going to on, on your channel, uh, the Civ Dev, mine, Veterans Info Tap. Um, but I did get a lot of comments about how he's a he's a solid dude, solid, solid um, representation, um, those types of things for for some folks that followed him, knew who he was. Um, as far as as how he's going to be as um, the, the VA secretary, I think it's interesting because he's a former congressman. So, yeah, I think that that could actually be in our benefit. OK, if he has our um if he has veterans best interests in mind right and as he's trying to navigate and do things with congress one he knows congressional members already right now mm -hmm. granted when you have when you have the the executive branch the the house and the senate it's it's a different world anyway but having somebody who's who understands that side the the political side he'll know how to politic things help get things across the uh the aisle uh if needed uh is an important aspect i think um and you know we've seen currently what it looks like when the va gives it to congress i mean look what's happened over the last Anybody who thinks that that's what's happened with the VA over the last four years, if they think that's normal business, it's not. And, yeah. and, and it really put a, a bad, bad look on the VA. So I'm hoping that some of that can get corrected. Um, and that's my my biggest thing, uh, too. As far as the uh, piece you talked about, Clay, with the idea of privatization of VA, I'm going to throw this out there and then I'll let you take it. Mm -hmm. it will never be a hundred percent. And I know you already mentioned that up front. It's, it's just not. And when we talk about, you know, Oh, the VA is going to VHA is going to lose funding and we'll dive further into that. Um, no, they're not. Even if it's unauthorized, I mean, maybe sure for something little over here. I mean, look, the VA has done a very crappy job at uh, budgeting and forecasting. And for one minute, there were $3 billion a short, on on veterans benefits and then oh guess how we ended out the year do you know oh five billion surplus so really we didn't need the three billion we're actually two billion over so um it's and that's not even being talked about right but but guess who remembers and knows congress right mm -hmm. they know especially so, the, those who passed that uh, yeah, the rush please. three billion yeah. bill, right it just drives me nuts clay I, i'm just so frustrated um so, so all that to say is that, sure, I think there'll be some cleaning out at the VA, but, you know, I mean, wasted money's wasted money. And if, as long as we're not being affected, cool. I can't tell you what's in the VA and anybody who could sit here and go, nope, the VA needs every penny they need. Well, now we're living in a, in a crazy world. You know, yeah. you need to look into it and see, first of all. And remember, we were $5 billion over, $5 billion over. That's a lot of money. Okay, what could your state do for veterans if the federal government gave them an extra billion, right? Um, so do I see an increase in uptick in community care and all that aspects? Yes. The other thing that I could see is, and in fact, th this was actually mentioned in, in Project 2025, funny enough, um, the idea of having shared facilities. So let's say yeah. that out in the middle of nowhere, there's a hospital, but that hospital isn't fully functioning well because there's not enough patients. But if you add in a VA center or uh, like a little clinic 
that shares the same medical facility has a different door for veterans with flags, right? And then we walk on the other side, whatever it is, right? You get the point. But now that's a win-win for the community, the community in which the veterans live, the all the residents, a healthier uh, residencyhood, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so, so I could see things like that happening. Um, you know, what, what I, I could keep going on and on. I'm so excited yeah, yeah. about this. Go ahead. Okay, we're going to cross into the privatizing here in a second. I do want to read two quotes from Doug Collins himself. Um, and I should have prefaced this with this, and I'm so glad you brought that up. We are going to speak in terms of the last four years and the next four years. And just to be very clear, veterans issues are bipartisan, and they should remain that way. In fact, the second that changes, that's when we're in trouble, right? You, veterans benefits can't be good when so-and-so is in the office and bad when so-and-so is in the office. That must remain bipartisan. So I, we should have said that at first. I'm probably going to cut that and put it at the beginning, actually, um, just because, right? And then second is uh, it's bipartisan. We're going to mention like last four years, next four years, because that's how the VA secretary position kind of runs. Um, it's not necessarily a mention to the Biden administration and the Trump administration, just food for thought. It's We're just talking about the VA right now. It's bipartisan. Keep it bipartisan because when it's not, that's when we're going to be in big trouble, right? Anyways, the quote I want to read, there's two of them from Doug Collins, and we can kind of break this down. He says, we will fight tirelessly to streamline and cut regulations in the VA root out corruption, and ensure every veteran receives the benefits they've earned. Together, we will make the VA work for those who fought for us. Time to deliver our veterans and give them the world-class care they deserve. So I, I want to break that down because I know someone's going to talk about cutting VA regulations. Um, I do not think it is implied that that is for VA disability or VA SRD. And I'm telling you right now, the high level, high, high, high level, um, they're not worried, at least right now, about VA SRD, right? The schedule rating of disabilities. And so all those changes that are coming down, these are two separate op things, right? He's talking about cutting federal uh, regulations, probably in healthcare, if I had to take a wild guess, because Doug, Doug Collins is a, he's very focused on VA healthcare. He has been for the last 10 years. Um, and I think we see that because the very next quote in this same article I'm reading says, why does a veteran have to drive 80 miles to see a doctor when they already have trouble seeing to start with, right? Um, we see this a lot in the rural community. So for instance, me, I'm in, I am less than 10 minutes away from DC, right? I'm in the beltway. Traffic is absolutely insane here. When I go to the VA in DC, it's right across the Potomac. I just drive my little car, happy, happy little car across the bridge, which sucks, right? Uh, crazy enough for me, Jason, this is totally off topic. The VA is about maybe eight miles away. And it takes me a solid 40, 45 minutes to get there just because it's in D.C., right? I go to the VA in Washington, D.C., um, and it's, it's a good VA, at least from my experience. And that's easy for me, you know? Um, let's talk about someone who lives in where I'm from in Kentucky. You have someone who lives in Irvington, Kentucky. Um, you know, the next civilization is Fort Knox about an hour away. What does healthcare look like for those veterans? And trust me, there's a ton, a ton of veterans in rural communities who simply, they have access to VA healthcare, meaning they're eligible. They don't have proximal access or physical access in those rural communities. And so it gets, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up, Jason, because I do think what we're going to see, the biggest change under the Trump VA, I would argue, and probably, probably gamble some money on, right? Not that I do, is a step in the right direction, right, according to my definition, on what supplementing VA healthcare looks like with privatizing healthcare for those rural communities, okay? I'm going to leave it at that. Um, feel free to add any thoughts, or we can segue yeah. and add the privatization of VH, VHA, because yeah. that is a goods and bads, you know? Right. So so just to, to 
point out real quick if just to give the correct numbers if you're somebody who is trying to get an appointment with the va community care becomes an option and should be allowed to you although i've seen comments hasn't happened to me personally but i've seen comments in in different videos i've done saying that they people have been denied uh, there's also been quotations from uh i think it was sharif ellenhall um where there was some quote quotes that were given about how he was pushing on the medical uh side of the house to to not make it easy for community care to steer people into the va healthcare system no matter what essentially um and now it's real quick. yeah jump in real quick sorry um this just came off the top of my mind and i want to drop this bomb and then give it right back to you i'm glad you brought up ellen hall he's that's the vha uh dir dir director is that his title whatever yeah he's the ses of the vha um the last four years this what bothers me jason is whenever politics start affecting veterans we saw the last four years kind of erode and take away from community care and i asked myself is that because of funding which which is a plausible answer right it's a logical thought community care does cost a lot um or is it a way that one admin can make another admin look bad and if that's the case i think that's where veterans will will see themselves in trouble that's no longer bipartisan right right and so food for yeah. thought i want to drop that bomb yeah. i'm sorry for and, interrupting. And, and, and yeah yeah and, and here's my thoughts on that is that i think that that when you get at the highest echelons of leadership in any organizations or you become an elected official or you're appointed or you're you're at the highest echelons self-preservation is a very very real thing mm -hmm. and if you don't have cheeks in the seat at your vha facilities you're no longer relevant now you risk losing staff you risk losing your footprint you risk losing all kinds of things so from from that perspective from a business perspective i get it drive people to us they must come here they must come here i get that but not at the detriment of the veteran right so because this is not a business right because it's not a business yeah. you can't look at it that way but people do right i have these employees that i need to make sure that they have enough patients coming through to keep them employed um you might have some of that feeling uh, as well but when it comes to community care clay you know it says that if if the va can't schedule an appointment for you at a va health facility that's within 30 minute average drive 30 minute average not 30 miles 30 minute a 30 minute average drive from your home or we can't schedule an appointment for you within the next 20 days uh then that should uh, make it to where you can be able to utilize community care for primary or mental health uh for specialty care they kick it out a little further but for primary and mental health uh that's that's the way that it should be and you know when you think about the va and the va's footprint i, I get it people it's a weird situation clay because you know you want your cake and you want to eat it too right i want a robust va vha system out there for me but if i live far away and i can't utilize it well then i also want to be able to have community care at my fingertips. And from a cost perspective, the VA is better off to do community care than to establish another clinic somewhere that gets very few people. It's kind of off and on. Um, and on top of that, think about our population, right? Our veteran population, the population in general, really, since, since COVID, right all of a sudden people are like oh wait a minute i don't need to live here i can move anywhere i have now a remote job or i can go get a different job or i started opening up maybe i don't want to live in a city anymore maybe i want to go live somewhere else when that starts happening in the form of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people well now all of a sudden that va facility that's sitting there that got built 15 years ago has lost 20 percent of their veteran base mm -hmm. that's that's not a good way to run a business right so now those facilities will have to do something over time right might not happen today 
but 10, 15 years from today, maybe a base closed somewhere, right? Through, through a BRAC. And now you have less veterans that are replenishing the ones that are dying. And so the population of veterans is decreasing. Now you have a VA facility that's halfway running, half of it's cordoned off. What they'll have to do is partner with the community to put in civilian care in there. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many things that go beyond the bumper sticker of, you know, VA healthcare should be everywhere. Well, okay. Yeah, sure. But let's, you got to be responsible. You can't just have a bunch of people sitting around on their hands. Back to you. Absolutely. I, I am loving this rant style. We need to do more topics like this. And I'm going to try my best to keep reiterating this because I know comments are going to be absolutely insane here, um, which is okay. You know, we, I don't know about Jason. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I, I'm sure Jason would agree. Uh, comments on this channel and my channel, I so welcome differing opinions, right? I want to see it all because we are the veteran community. It's not right or wrong. And we all have our opinions, which is totally cool. And uh, again, to reiterate bipartisan, the Mission Act, right, which was Trump's first four-year term, um, that was a bipartisan legislation. It was not a red wave like we see today in the Senate and the House. It was bipartisan, which is good. We see the PACT Act get passed. I already know people are going to go, so-and-so didn't. Got it. Okay. Um, it still passed. And PACT Act was bipartisan, signed by Biden. So we, that's two solid examples. One healthcare, v, VA healthcare related, one VA disability related. PACT Act is largely VA healthcare too. Um, bipartisan legislations that were passed, you know, House, Senate, President signed, boom, bing. That's where we're at today. So yes, veteran issues are bipartisan. I'm going to try to reiterate that as much as I possibly can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I agree. And on the comments, on the comment side, I do not delete. Look, my feelings don't get hurt. I yeah. everybody look. I'm just trying to, and we are trying to just share a perspective of things. Sometimes things get carried too far one way or the other, and we're trying to just hone it in and, and go down the middle here um, with with what information we have and what knowledge base we have. All comments are welcome. I do not delete any comments. Mm -hmm. If a comment gets deleted, YouTube did it, not me. Yeah. Right. Um, it's weird. I, I don't I don't know why it happens. And I've had people say you deleted my comment. I'm like, nah, I don't even know what comment you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have I have I don't even know how many 1400 videos. I'm I don't have time to figure out all the comments. Um, so somebody else replied and said, look, if you say certain things, YouTube will do it. Try saying something that includes these types of things and you'll see. <laughs> And, you know, I just take people's word for it. Um, I've heard it happen. My wife says it all the time that her comments get deleted. So, so there's that. Well, <laughs> anyway, what you so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought that up, Jason. And I, I also want to speak on that because I've deleted four comments since I've been doing YouTube. And I only, I've, those four comments were directed uh, towards my family. People got real nasty uh, a few oh, times. Wow. So that I will delete. Other than, those, other than those four, I've also never deleted a comment ever. YouTube does it. I'm glad you said that. I'm going to clip that and make this its own video. And every time someone says this, I'm going to go to Veterans Daily and reply to this. Yeah, <laughs> reply yeah. To that comment with that clip. But, uh, okay, sorry. Back on privatizing VA healthcare, right? And we're saying that, remember, it's a supplement. Just like any v, just like any contract, the purpose of a contractor, even in my office, we have contractors. It's to supplement the workforce, supplement something. That's essentially what the contract is for. DOD can't do it. Now they're going to pay for it. Boom, you have the private world. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about pri privatizing VA. It's not a full-on privatization because keep in mind, the VA is the second largest federal entity. That is a big deal. You have the DOD, which is just stupid big, right? Um, if you're a veteran, you were once a part of the DOD. Congrats. Okay. Um, if you are a federal uh, civil ser service employee, you're a part of the DOD, um, depending on what agency you work with, right? And the second largest entity is the VA. It is huge. Okay. And if you're going to piece the pie on all the VA, 
the very, very tippy top of the triangle, which is the smallest part, is cemetery. I forgot is what it the, the smallest the, part. Yeah. Is that the smallest part, Clay? Good job. The smallest the part. The very, very tippy top. Right. Whenever you die, yeah. you get buried. Okay. Now sign up for burial benefits. I need to do a video on that. Actually, it's pretty easy to do. Um, the second part, which is still small, is VA disability. Everyone thinks that VA disability is this monstrous piece of the VA, which it is. It's the VBA, right? Um, but disability spe specifically is not that big relative to VHA. Healthcare is ginormous when it comes to the Department of Veteran Affairs. So generally, when people say VA, they're mainly talking about healthcare unless they specify disability benefits or education benefits. Real quick, I, I, I want to say that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're so the VBA staff yeah. or VBA staff and disability compensation payments, mm -hmm. right? Those are two gigantic different things. Yeah, absolutely. good. I, I, absolutely. So if someone just says VA in general, they're probably leaning towards VA healthcare. And so I want to say that because you're going to see a lot of things come out that talk about VA and just know it's probably talking about VA healthcare and looking at federal regulations on VA healthcare. It's, it's really access, Jason. And um, I'll share something slightly personal, not all the details, right? But my kids are sick. We'll just say, we'll just say that they're very sick and um, their access to the hospital is limited because there's not enough beds in the hospital literally right it's a physical issue there's not enough beds not enough nurses and so now they have outpatient cl cl clinics so my kids go to this outpatient clinic all the time almost every week okay um that is that would that i think that's a good example at least for my brain on how to look at supplementing privatizing the VA, right? So VA would be their main hospital, so to speak. And this outpatient clinic that they go see for little things, that's the supplemental workforce, right? Saying, Hey, if you need this, you need antibiotics, you're sick, you need a fever, you need a blood draw. You can go to this outpatient clinic because we just don't have the staff in the physical space for you at the big hospital. So we go to the outpatient clinic and that's essentially what privatizing VA healthcare would look like. It gives veterans more access, right? And and I don't care if you are a Bernie type. Um, I don't care if you voted for Harris, Biden. I do not care if you voted for Trump, Obama, Bush, whoever. Uh, I don't think there's a single veteran out there who could look me in the eye and say veterans should not have more access to healthcare, right? Because it's just a, it's almost a statement of fact. Right. It's a bipartisan issue. Right. And um, I'll, this is my last thing on privatizing the VA. I'll kick it over to you and then we can kind of uh, tra transition from here. Right. I think privatizing the VA overall is going to be a good thing. However, comma, when you look at government contracts, and I think CMP exams are a great example, that is time for, you know, what some would say fraud, waste, and abuse where you're paying um, kind of like the DOD contracts, right? They're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for things that cost a few hundred. And so is that a risk? It absolutely is. Um, that's the that's my main concern about privatizing VA healthcare because if you look at funding in the VA, the number one most expensive thing that we pay for, we meaning taxpayers, is VA healthcare right? Specifically community care. It is a fortune. Um, but you also look at the PACT Act. The PACT Act gave access to millions. I'm not talking hundreds of thousands. Millions right. of veterans have access to health care and someone has to, you know, provide intake. They, so yeah, they have to provide. They have to intake. We're talking administration. We're talking IT systems. It's, it's a huge organization. And, uh, some, yeah. you know, I've, I've, I've been critical of the PACT Act and real quick. I just think it's the PACT Act is great. I have no complaints. However, comma, everything has a however comma today. Um, it did flood the system on the disability side of the house, obviously. And it really flooded the system on the VHA side of the house. And uh, I will tell you this about Doug Collins 
and the v, the VA, the Trump admin, Trump VA, if, if you will, what a good title. I'm totally going to use that. Um, <laughs> the Trump VA has their hands full. Okay. We'll say, I'll say that at the least. It's not going to be pretty. They're going to have to be some ripping, ripping the band aids off. Um, I think the Trump VA needs small wins, J- Jason, like, like, like we had talked about before this. Um, and that's my final thoughts on privatizing the VA. I think it's good, but I think there's some risks that we need to definitely be aware of. And, and by all means, if the Trump V, if the Trump VA does something that we don't like, um, Jason and I will cover it just like we did with the previous VA secretary, right? Um, I'm going to continue to slam the VA when they do wrong. And when they do right, I'll continue to praise the VA just like we do. I'm sure Jason will do the same. Okay. That was a lot. Yeah. I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, my man, last I get thoughts it. on privatizing VA. What do you got? Yeah. So let's look at it the other way real quick. There's a lot of people, I've seen a lot of comments out there about, you know, don't privatize the VA, right? Mm-hmm. That's like the worst thing in the world that could happen. One, I think a lot of people hear that and they think that that means 100%. Just like, okay, VHA shut down. There's no longer a VHA. Instead, there's just contracts out to all these civilian providers. You're going to Kaiser now, right? Um, that's that's most likely never going to be the case, right? I mean, I, I, I don't see that. It's the more of the supplemental aspect with community care, with a more... I guess, um, codified version that's just solidified in there that you know that this is where you just go now. You don't have to, you don't, if you don't have a place near you, you don't even need to call them, right? You just go to that doctor and it's taken care of. So, so one, it's not shutting down the entire VA is what we're imagining. We're imagining a supplemental to the existing structure. Okay. So we have an overlay. Uh, throughout the United States, bam, then you got all of the medical centers, then you got an overlay of all the clinics, and then you have an overlay of all of these potential um, partnerships, okay? Um, the VA has something that it's it's almost kind of like a BRAC, okay, on the VA side. So for those that remember what BRACs are, BRACs are the base realignment and closures, right? So when they go through and they're, everybody's stressed out that their base is going to get closed, right? Maybe you're on a short list or something. Um, So the VA kind of has something like that and it's called the air report and it's the asset and infrastructure review. Okay. What they do. And and this is why I hate bumper sticker ideas, man. It's, you got to look into things before you start coming up with a real concrete um, opinion. So so the asset um, and, and infrastructure review, what they're doing is they're looking at the population of veterans. And as we migrate and how the usage of different VA facilities and, you know, when you go to your VA facility, do you know if it's if it's being maximized or do you or is it 80 percent or is it 70 percent? Do they have rooms cordon off that they just don't even use? Mm-hmm. Um, are they having staffing issues? Are there not as many veterans through the door compared to five years ago? Is that a constant decrease down? These are all huge red flags. And it's kind of like a BRAC. They will readjust, move things, decide to close down a clinic, um, put a clinic somewhere else as we're moving across the country. So imagine for a moment, if you will, we have this country that's filled with veterans all over. We're all equally important. There's not one veteran that's more important than the other, okay? We all earn these benefits and we should be able to access access them. Imagine for a moment if it was no additional outside resources, period, ever, no way. We have to do it all at the VA. Cool if you live next to a VA, but that really sucks for the other, whatever the number is, 40%, 30%, I don't know. It's a lot of veterans. It's it's not fair to them. So then the question is, is how do you fix that? Well, you could build a clinic there. Well, that's going to cost money. Now you have to run that that facility. Now you got to hire staff. 
Now you're going to pay pensions. You're going to pay off the retirements on these people that you hired that were never hired before. You're going to grow the government, right? Which is expenditures. So when you're, when you're hiring government employees, it's not just hiring a government employee, right? Now you have the union you're dealing with. You, you also have all the retirements that come into play after the fact an ongoing expense, right? You get to, if somebody gets hurt, there's a workers comp issue. You have all the HR problems. All of that gets resolved when you write a contract and you have somebody else do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so depending on the information that's pulled, and, and I can't remember when the last one was, the last era. It must have been three years ago, four years ago. Uh, not that long ago, there was a, an, an air report done and they did some jockeying around and, and you know, maybe they put one clinic, took it from one medical facility and put it in another, trying to offload things and what have you. But the, the idea here is, is that the VHA is such a gigantic organization, one, super expensive, two, Three, doesn't necessarily meet the needs of all the people it's supposed to serve by law. Mm -hmm. How can they fix it? This is the only way. This is absolutely the only way to do it. And it's the only cost effective way, in my opinion. Even if it costs more on its face, it's less in the long run, in my opinion. And it's easy to pull the plug uh, on certain things. And as veterans contrast, or constrict right as veteran as the veteran population constricts well now it's just less in that area right if everybody moves well then that's just gone you have no building to worry about you have no employees to worry about you have nothing so we, we how would you like it if it was you could only get care if you live in these areas right yeah. you have to move there that's where you have to live and we'll take care of you but you got to move there and in fact if you can't live there we'll build some barracks for you and you can live in those right? That just seems horrific. So I think that just from a, a logical perspective, Clay, I think that it's really the only way to satisfy the obligation, right? Because there, there is an obligation. Mm -hmm. How do you do it to, to, you know, the people that are in remote areas, right? And, and remote, is even the wrong word because people think, oh my God, there's four, there's four veterans in these remote areas. There's four, right? No, what I'm saying is, is in the areas that are more than a 45 minute drive, an hour drive from, from the VA health, really, I have 73 doctors in this kind of retirement area where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a vacation-y type of an area or retirement area. There's all kinds of doctors and hospitals and I can't go to any of them. I got to drive an hour, right? So anyway, back to you, Clay. Yeah. I mean, I, I am so glad. I really loved how you painted that picture, you know? three major VA facilities in every single state. Let's just assume that's the case. That's still not enough, right? Look at the state of California. There are tons of veterans in California, okay? Look at Northern Virginia. We have a, um, I'm going to include Washington, D.C. because it's right across the river, right? There's a VA facility in Washington, D.C. There's a VA facility in Fort Belvoir. There's a VA facility in Fredericksburg. There's a VA facility in Richmond. All of those are within a two-hour span of each other, right? Four facilities just in one state. That doesn't include actual Northern Virginia and then Southern Virginia, uh, you know, Southern Virginia, if you will. And so three major VA facilities in every state is not going to even scratch the surface. And um, I would make the argument, I'm going to say something wild here. I, I would make the argument that if you don't, do some kind of supplemental privatization of the workforce for VA healthcare and for veterans, um, you are in the most literal sense telling those veterans who don't have proximal access, you're not getting healthcare. Yeah. Right? And uh, I'm not telling a Vietnam veteran that. No. I'm not going to tell a peacetime veteran that. I'm not telling a Gulf, you know, shield storm veteran. I'm not telling a Panama Bosnia veteran that I'm not telling a post 9-11 I'm definitely not telling a post 9-11 veteran that and it's just that's that's where we're at right now okay a, a 20 plus year war on top of all the other veterans that we've we've had prior to that okay um we have a lot of veterans now what do you expect from a 20 plus year war not to mention 
Marines, I'm going to say Marine Corps because I know, Marines are still in Somalia. Marines are still in Iraq. Marines are still all across the globe right now. Um, so that 20-year-plus war is still going on. If you don't know, now you know, okay? Um, all right. I'm going to leave it there, Jason. Sounds good. That, the, the healthcare thing is going to get under my skin a li little bit because it needs to be supplemented. In the same breath, and this is going to be contradictory. It's going to be funny. Um, we have the Vivek and Elon Musk, right? Those are your – I've seen comments of how they're, um, you know, TikTok – politicians now and they're uh you know youtube short clip politicians meaning they weren't politicians they kind of made their claim to fame and during especially during vivek's campaign buying ads on tiktok and all across facebook you know he's the he's the millennial he's the younger uh new blood if you will so he, he kind of brings that to, to, to the table and people will say that to discredit him um and whether I don't have any personal thoughts on Vivek at all, okay? Um, but uh, whether you support him or not, I, we need to talk about cutting federal agencies because for some reason, people have correlated Vivek and Elon Musk in Doge, right, with cutting VA benefits. And I don't know how people's brains work to connect those two, but they're not. They're not. Um, that's not what they're talking about. I'm going to give an example, okay? Not to give too much information, um, but I am a federal employee, okay? Long story short, um, there was some cuts made in Congress a couple years ago, about two or three years ago. And when changes are made in Congress for DOD and federal civilians, it takes a while to actually implement. That's where we're at right now, actually, today. And so Congress cut about 5,000 federal positions um, across agencies. And my shop was affected. Pfft, luck of the draw. Am I right? And so just to be very clear, I, I, right now, I'm going to talk about it on the worker level, not the policy level. And so what does that look like for my shop? And this is real. This is not um, exaggeration. This is real life right now as I'm talking. Uh, my, my actual coworkers are going through this, right? So all, all that to say this. You have positions that are authorized and positions that are funded, okay? Sometimes people will call them one and one meaning authorized and funded. That's a one and one position that when you see a job posting on USA.gov uh, jobs or whatever it's called, right? That position is one and one It's authorized, it's funded, boom. What happens when agencies make cuts is you can't just fire people. It's not, it's not, a, you know, it's, we're not working at McDonald's. You can't just fire them and say, hey, you, you don't, you know, don't, don't come in next week. You don't work here anymore. That's not how federal agency works because there's a security around that. And so now these 5,000 positions, and I'm using that as a general number there, um, that are now O and 1, meaning not authorized, but still funded. The DOD, I work for the DOD, but this is all agencies, Department of State, wherever else. They're not just going to fire you next week, okay? There's security in that position. That's mainly why people gravitate towards those positions. So my position is O and 1. It's not authorized. It is funded, meaning I'm still getting paycheck. That's nice, right? We still like to get paid. Um, the issue with that is there are no plans, no plans to enact what Congress actually said, which was, hey, we we are overspending these positions because we don't need them anymore, right? Priorities shifted, you know, for for the Marine Corps, priorities really shifted to the Pacific. So anything CENTCOM related kind of got lower on the pole. So that's the policy discussion. I'm not going to talk that because it's way over my head. Um, and sorry I'm taking so long on this, Jason. I just really want to explain this because <laughs> this is this is how it works. All right. I'm not an HR, but I understand the the context within my job, right? And so now these positions, what happens are people retire. Lots of federal, everyone in my office who is a civilian was a contractor prior and they were military prior to that. And they've been in that seat for over 20 years. And that's not a joke. I work with a lot of old people who are real subject matter experts in that position, right? So these are the people we're talking about. All those positions are not authorized but they're funded. And so when they retire, they just don't get backfilled. Right. Right. Now yeah. let's just hypothetically say 
I was never going to leave my position ever. I'm going to stay 0-1 until I'm 62, right? Whatever. I don't know what the retirement age is. I'm so far from that, Jason. May, may, maybe you can talk <laughs> to me about that. <laughs> right? But that's, so if I stayed in that position, assuming Congress maintained those cuts, I would be in an 0-1 position forever. Right. And one or two things would happen. I would either, I would either stay in my same position or as a one and one position opened up, they would just move me to that position. Right. So I'm still right. going to maintain my paycheck. Um, and I wanted to explain that because that's what happened in the VA. I think there was, a, you know, some buzz about six months ago, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong on that, where the VA was uh, cutting 10 million jobs. Was that, yeah. is that a big number? No, no. 10,000. 10,000. Yep. Okay. 10 million was 10, a lot. <laughs> yeah. 10, I don't think they have 10 million yet, but, but 10,000 and uh, it was in the VHA and their plan was to do it through attrition, which is what yeah. you were talking about. So those are all O in one positions. Um, just like how Congress made cuts to my agency, department of VA, which is an agency. Okay. There's federal civilians that work for the VA. Same thing. Those positions, 10,000 of them were one and one and yep. sign of a pen, they became O and one. And right. so now it's through attrition, you know, people naturally leave. I don't yep. plan to stay in my job forever. I could if I wanted to, um, but people naturally leave, right? Especially when you get told that your position is not authorized, but it's funded, you kind of right. lose that uh, sense of purpose in your position, right? So There's people a little naturally leave. Um, or, and if you don't, you can stay there forever and they will continue to pay you and they should move you to a one-on-one -on -one position. Okay. I want right. to lay the groundwork. I hope that explained it, um, on, on what cutting federal positions and federal agencies look like. It's not VHA gone. We're going private. That's not stop commenting that. That's not the case. Okay. <laughs> I don't see any more comments that says that because it's not the case. Um, you're, you're, I think people are, people have knee jerk reactions, you know, like how, how we make uh, thumbnails and titles to get views. Um, people will read we those. You know, Jason did a 31 minute video last week and I'm, I'm watching it. I get, I get no, no notifications, Jason. I watch your videos. Don't worry. Um, and 31 minute video. I think I was four minutes in um, and I was in, I was walking around. So I had to, re I had to close my phone and I had to hit refresh. The video just posted maybe, maybe five minutes. Let's just say 10 to give it, you know, some, some, uh, some leeway there. There was probably 50 comments before the vid, and you can't, you can't finish a 30 minute video in 10 minutes and people right. were commenting the exact opposite of what Jason is saying, meaning they did not watch the video. Just like how people will read a Just headline based off the title, article, right? and they don't read the article. And YouTube is, you know, if that's you, you should be ashamed. And I'm for real because I get not wanting to read an article. Sometimes I can be lazy, but you're gonna you're gonna be on YouTube, click a video, and not listen to it before you make a dumb comment. Anyways, that's my rant on that. Federal agencies are being cut, yes, and just for the record, the 10,000 positions, the 5,000 positions in my agency, that was done during whose administration? There we go. So it's not a Trump's cutting this, Biden's cutting that. These are bipartisan issues, okay? There are positions, and I'm going to speak DOD specifically, because we shifted, right, to UCOM area, Europe, Eastern Europe, and Pacific, and I'll kind of leave it at that. We don't want to go into that too much. Um, away from CENTCOM, you're going to have new positions emerge and old positions go away. And that's what we see with the natural defense strategy, the NDAA, the national security strategy, all these, all these high-level policy type stuff. That's all I got, Jason, on that all topic. Right. I, I, I wanted to explain it on the ground level, right? I, I love it. A lot of it it's perfect. It's perfect. So, so now we know that organizations within the federal government can continue to receive funding. So every year, they're asking for their budget, their budget ask, right? 
Here's the high level overview. This is the money that we need to sustain where we're currently at. Congress, you know, says, yep, that sounds good. You rubbed elbows with the right people and you got your message across. Boom, it makes it to the president's desk and bam, it's signed into law and you get your funding. So you're continuing on doing the same thing you've always done. And there's no additional legislation or red tape that you need to do. It's just kind of happening. It's just happening through your budget ask. So here's an interesting thing. Here's the headline. And, and I love the headline here in, in not the way you might think. Vivek Ramasawamy wants to start doge cuts by eliminating funding for unauthorized programs, including veterans health care. Okay, let's take a step back. Huh. Okay. Wants to eliminate funding for unauthorized programs. Oh, okay. I'm kind of okay with the unauthorized. Well, why the hell are you funding it? Right? Let's look into it and why is it unauthorized? And oh, by the way, if it should be authorized, then authorize it. Right? Then put together some legislation that makes it so and then push it on. Right? If you are a department leader, then you need to put together your rationale on why you need to have X and then push it to your congressional members, rub your elbows and get that funded. So I'm so far, I'm okay with that. Unauthorized programs, figure it out, make it authorized, then it's not an issue, right? So if you are anywhere in the government today and you have unauthorized programs, but you feel as though you should be whole, then you need to start working up a plan and start having conversations. I'm just saying to make it authorized because then they're not going to look at it because they're looking at unauthorized programs. Now, the next piece here, Clay, it talks about the Veterans Healthcare Eligibility Reform Act of 1966. Okay. This is the unauthorized program that they're talking about. Now, what's really funny. Clay, and you're going to you're going to fall off your chair if you don't already know this one. Veterans Healthcare Eligibility Reform Act of 1966 through to today, today was 120-ish billion dollars. Okay, what equals about 120 billion? Oh, it's the entire VHA, the whole thing, all of it. Okay, so what you're saying here is that they're planning on Getting rid of VHA, you no longer are in existence. No, not going to happen. I'm so sorry. So the what's happening here, sadly, is publications, news outlets are drawing a line from cutting unauthorized programs to, okay, what's unauthorized that that is scary so we could draw a line to it. Okay, well, this Veterans Healthcare Eligibility Reform Act of 1996 was only authorized through 1998. Well, why do they do that? They always put little short term thing. They could revise it, tweak it, change it, whatever. Well, they just never did. And they just kept asking for the money. VA said, we need more money. We're growing. We need this to sustain. Congress says, okay, here's the money. And they move on. Kind of what you were talking about. So that's the way that it's been uh, all the way through, through, through to now. So what's going to happen? The VA secretary, and really the current secretary should do this, but I don't think he's going to waste his time on it. But really the current VA secretary at this moment should go, oh, I see a potential issue. Let's go work with Congress, have them put together legislation that pushes this down another whatever, two, three, five years. So that way it's authorized funding. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come in and do it, even though it's not, but just to tie that extra bow around it. Okay. Well now it's, it's authorized. You're, you're not going to, to, you're not going to not, um, have the VHA, right? It's, it's still going to be in existence. I'm, I'm sorry. The funny thing here, Clay, is that when they're talking about these unauthorized programs that are, that are in the crosshairs of Doge, there's 1,200 of them, 1,200 unauthorized programs. Now, some of them might be, you know, $10,000 for uh, diapers to Ukraine, right? So some of them will be very small. Some of them will be gigantic. 
So they picked this gigantic one of $120 billion um, and said, look, unauthorized, and they want to do unauthorized programs. That's what they said. So now they want to cut VA. But nowhere have I seen any quotes from anybody saying, we're going to eliminate the VHA. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm missing it somewhere, and I would love to see it. So if you find it, anybody, please share it with us. Back to you, Clay, your thoughts. Yeah, just like how I'm going to go back to our titles and th 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 thumbnails because I get recently I've been getting a lot of hate on how I structure my titles and do thumbnails. Um, but food for thought, we need engagement, right? If we have the best content ever and the title sucks and the thumbnail sucks, it gets no views, meaning no one watches it. So food for thought, that's why we do it, okay? And it's crazy to me that people will give a slip on our titles and thumbnails for videos, but yet they see a headline exactly as you described about cutting VA healthcare. And it's like, okay, well, nowhere in there to talk about cutting VA healthcare at all. It could be a program of, hey, you know, the VA bought, software that they don't use anymore and we they have a yearly subscription right it's a uh, one million dollars for a yearly subscription of this software that vha does not use it's not authorized but they're still paying it why because government that's why right federal government um if you think right. i'm a fan of the federal government that answers no which is ironic because my entire adult life every dollar i'd received um in my adult life has been from the federal government <laughs> Um, whether it's a contract agency, a civilian, or military, right? Um, but yeah, that's why. Okay, so don't – if you're going to give a slip on our titles and th th thumbnails, um, which is totally fine. You can do that. We welcome comments, right? I won't delete them. YouTube will. I won't. And uh, just read the headline of the article that you're looking at. Um, I won't even look at where it came from because I wouldn't have that lens of Fox, CNN, MSN, right. military.com, right? I wouldn't even look at that as like a credibility source because they're all, they're all not credible. That's my opinion though. But <laughs> read the headlines, actually read what's going on. Um, and to be very clear, the Trump administration is not going to cut VA healthcare at all. The headline might say that we're looking at unauthorized programs or even positions that are not are or not authorized but still being funded. That's what they're referring to. These are billions of dollars, okay? And I already know someone's going to say, "I don't think I've made a video that hasn't had this comment in the past six months." Is we can give you know billions of dollars to Ukraine, but we can't do it for VA healthcare, and that is a solid solid statement of fact okay way over our head um but they're looking at cutting down federal spending on things that are useless right that's the department of government Efe efficiency which is i guess what they're going to call it okay um that's my last thought which cracked on me up by the way <laughs> I, I think it's so funny that it's doge I, yeah it's it's so funny so, so let, me, let me time this in real quick yeah let me chime this in real quick clay so it says that there was a recent report uh, from the Congressional Budget Office that found more than 1,200 programs at more than $516 billion a year. When an unauthorized, or excuse me, when an authorization expires, I love your, you know, we signed up for this whatever so we could, you know, train everybody on this software. So we signed up for this extra thing and it costs whatever, a million dollars a year, right? Yeah. Uh, I love that example because that's a very true thing. And it's mm -hmm. like those numbers just roll up and somebody says, this is how much money we need for our budget. And then somebody else goes, okay, that's what we need for the budget. They're not looking down at the million dollars because they don't really give a shit about a million dollars. <laughs> right. So um, it says uh, $516 billion a year. When, uh, when an authorization expires, Congress can extend the program through new legislation or by providing new appropriations according to to the cbo and then uh ramaswamy yes like, you get money you get money you yeah get yeah money. yeah we need yeah, to make yeah. a contacting company jason we're in the wrong that's right here. that's right oh man so if i would have known so uh it, it says he here's his quote and i just want you to to think about this in the context of the overall view okay take 
take the title out of it the title of this of this new art article that they're they're targeting unauthorized programs oh and that includes the va right take that part out and just let's read through it and see if it see if it makes sense we shouldn't let the government spend money on programs that have expired. Yet that's exactly what's happening today. Half a trillion dollars of taxpayer funds Wild. goes each year to programs which Congress has allowed to expire. There are 1,200 plus programs that no longer are authorized but still receive appropriations. One last little piece and then I'll be done. This is totally nuts. We can and should save hundreds of billions of dollars each year by defunding government programs that Congress no longer authorizes. We'll challenge any politician who disagrees to defend their side. Oh, hey, we haven't been funding the VA uh, uh, authorized. We have not authorized the VA for continued funding on the VHA side, the entire VHA, by the way. So um, we're just going to tie a bow around that and here's the little piece of legislation and uh now we're good hey sounds good we don't want to screw over all these veterans with all their medical issues of all the veterans these are the most vulnerable uh, so yeah thanks for buttoning that up and doing your part congress uh by making sure that uh it's authorized back over to you clay yeah last thing i'll say about that and i'm i'm, I'm gonna put it in barney style terms here right Jason and I were, bo were bo both Marines. Here's the Marine version of what Jason just explained. Um, the best way to get, at least, at least when, I, when I was a squad leader back, back back in the day, the best way to get my Marines, if they were in trouble, you know, hazing was a thing back then, not anymore. Um, the best thing to do is make them do their job, right? Grab, I was a mortarman. Jason was also coincidentally a mortarman, right? We shared the same MOS. Um, but if you make your squad section, whatever that lo lo looks like for you, do their job, grab the tubes, go run PT road with an 81 on your back with bipods, with the base plates, um, whatever it is, you know, if they were out drunk late last night, they got a speeding ticket, whatever stupid, you know, junior Marines do making them do their job and making it hard is a really good way to, to, to fix things. Let's just say that, right. And so that's how I see this. We see the Department right. of Government Efficiency. Um, it is a way to make Congress, and not just Congress, federal agencies do their job. And I like how you brought that up saying, hey, we're cutting this. And if that agency or, or Congress says, well, we actually need this for X, Y, Z, what Vivek is essentially saying is if you need it, that's fine. We, we are America. We have half a trillion. To, we can pay for it. The issue is not we can't pay for it. Obviously, we can pay for it. We're paying for it every single year. The issue is we're paying for nothing, right? And so I see Doge as a forcing function to get agencies, like SES-level agencies and Congress to do their job. And that's, you know, I would love to see Congress uh, men and women on PT road carrying 81s and bipods and base plates, right? But that's essentially what they're going to be doing so to speak, right. that's my ana analogy. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And if you, and if you've ever carried an eighty one, it's especially so the tube weighs thirty five pounds, and I hate myself because I remember that. Um, but the bipods are so weird; they're so off balance. That's the worst piece to carry. Uh, but and, but uh, the base plate is so far back on your pack that it it pulls you down yeah. even more. You got to get but the but the but, uh, the but the bipods dig in your neck. Yeah, and they're so just you got to pick your poison. It all sucks, you know. I, I like to I like to trade out, you know, tube for a mile, bipods for a mile, base plate for a mile, and then hopefully by whatever we're doing, 10k, 20k, um, I'm not dead. Anyways, that's Here, I all got something I have. For you. I got something for I got yeah. something for everybody. All right. How can you make sure, right, the veterans are taken care of? Well, Elon Musk is asking for resumes. Okay, so if you're a smart one out there, if you got a high IQ and you're smart, I guess that's kind of together, and you're smart, you got a high IQ number thing, then uh, I'm going to read this little spot. So we, this is from, uh, from Elon, I think. 
We are very grateful to the thousands of Americans who have expressed interest in helping us at Doge, the agency wrote on X Thursday. We don't need more part-time idea generators. We need super high IQ small government revolutionaries willing to work 80 plus hours per week on unglamorous cost cutting. If that's you, DM this account with your resume. Elon and Vivek will review the top 1% of applicants. So if you're smart and you want to affect change for the better and keep veterans safe, go do that. I'll still work 80 I, hours. I away. can't send my resume. <laughs> no. Um, all right. Awesome. You know, that's going to be a solid. I'm also going to clip that too. You know, Elon Musk wants veterans to work for him. Um, although look at that, that's uh, a yeah. good example of a title and then reading it. Right. Okay. The last good topic, job. we can do this fairly quick, Jason. It is probably the most important that people really want to know is a Trump VA. What does VA disability look like? And, uh, uh, rip the Band-Aid off approach, okay? And I know we're going to have negative comments, which is fine, and we're not going to delete them, okay? And just so everyone knows, I read every single comment. I may not respond, but I read them all. I get about 3,200 comments on average a month. Now, Jason has four times as many videos as I do, so he's probably... It's a full-time job for him to read his comments, I assume, right? Hopefully, I get to uh, where you're at one day, J Jason. Um, so I read them all. I don't delete them. I may not respond, but I read every single one. And with, I'm prefacing that because Project 2025 is over here. It is that wish list. You can talk about how, you know, a certain side of the aisle media, if you will, really correlated Project 2025 and Trump. You can talk about that. You can even say that Trump you know, worked with uh, people who worked at the Heritage Foundation. You can say all of that, all right? And you can even say, and this is probably the best argument that anyone has on Project 2025, is with a Trump administration, a red Senate, and a red House, um, if P2025 was going to be enacted, it would be now. You could say that, and that is at least, lot. that's the most logical thing you could say with that, okay? Um, however... Politicians on an individual level are not going to, and when I say Project 2025, I'm specifically talking about VBA right now, right? VHA talks about privatization, and we already we already covered that. There's some goods and some bads in that we need to have a pulse on. I'm specifically talking about the section in Project 2025 um, that is titled VBA. It's about six pages, I think, Jason. Right? It's not that long. Um, and so that's what we are referring to right now. So when I say P25, I'm honing in on the VBA aspect side of the house. Um, you have P25 over here, which has the wish list of ways to cut federal spending. This is not a Vivek Elon Musk conversation. That's over here too. This is P25 only. I have to say that because people will correlate that together. It happens all the time. And so um, that's the goal of Project 125 is cut the deficit. Right. Um, cut spending, which arguably I think everyone could agree with. We need to cut spending, cut federal spending somehow, so, some way. Maybe not how P2425 wants to do it. OK. Um, but that's the goal of Project 2025, which is over here. You have Trump administration over here. Now, this is largely conservative. When I say largely um, it's because you have some you have some libertarian figureheads within P25 as well. I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, but yes, fe federal government is bad. OK, anyways, <laughs> um, it's largely conservative. Right. You see you see pro um, I'm sorry, anti-abortion stuff in P Project 2025. That's why I'm saying it's largely conservative. That does not mean the Trump thing. You can say you can say J.D. Vance has, you know, personal relationships with those and the Heritage Foundation, um, which is which is a statement of fact. That's not wrong. But again, you have Trump, J.D. Vance admin over here. You have Elon Musk and Vivek over here. You have uh, Doug Collins. That's his name, right? Doug Collins, the new VA secretary. 
um, over here. I cannot wait to make thumbnails with his face on it whenever he does something I don't like. And um, all over here, Project 2025 over here. I'm sorry I took so long to explain that. I just really want people to know these are not connected. Okay. Yeah. And on the individual level, if any politician introduces in the House or the Senate to slash VA benefits, and in the VBA portion of P25, it talks about, you know, this is a paraphrase, um, and we had did a video on this, and we quoted it, but paraphrase is um, P25 wants to cut the regulations for service-connected disabilities that are not as directly related to military service, right? Meaning it's correlated. So I think I think sleep apnea secondary to PTSD would be a good example. It's correlation, right? Or sinusitis under the PACT Act, okay? Um, that is not causation. It's correlation. Now, you have many, 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 many studies that led to the PACT Act on which the conditions chosen for the PACT Act weren't just, you know, randomly selected. There's medical evidence, tons of it, studies um, that dictate what is what. But that's essentially what P25 wants to do. I want you to imagine on an individual politician level, you enact, hey, I want to cut veteran benefits. Uh, yeah, your career is over. <laughs> My, you're, it's over. It's over. Now, looking at it from a party perspective, because remember, Republicans run the White House, the Senate, and the House. Which is which is quite wild, right? That is insane. Um, big big win for Republicans. If if that's what, if anyone's wondering, no, I'm not Republican. No, I'm not a Democrat. You know, I don't know if Jason wants to share his views, but I'll share that. But nothing else. Um, anyways, food for thought. There you go. But uh, from a party perspective, if a party cuts VA benefits. That party is gone. You might, you might as well, you might as well just rename, pick a new color, and go that route, right? So, um, I know a YouTube video is not going to put you at ease, especially me um, in my voice that says, "Hey, your VA benefits are safe. Stop freaking out." I've had someone commented, you know, Trump's getting rid of the pack that. I'm like, bro, what are you? Where are you? What tea are you drinking, right? What shrooms are you taking? Give me some. Um, what does that look like for you? Just turn the news off. It's, you know, I just made a video last week, Jason, and I said, hey, turn the news off. Turn off the TV. Get off of TikTok. Um, heck, get off of YouTube. Watch our videos, though. Just right. Veterans Day, yeah, yeah. Veterans Info Tap, and Div Div. Yeah. Watch those three. Um, then get off of YouTube and go outside. Get some vitamin D in your life. Look at the sun. Let the sun hit your skin. And just breathe, okay? If someone who's in office affects your life that much, um, you got to be high up in the political scale, right? For every average day Joe, and I, I live 10 minutes from D.C. I work as a federal civilian. Um, I am entwined with the federal government, which hurts my soul to say. But uh, I don't care who's in, the, who's in the White House. My life's not affected, right? So if your life sucked last week, two weeks ago, Guess what happens when when Trump uh, takes takes over in what January or early February? January, Super Bowl time frame, whatever. Anyways, um, if your life sucked before that, your life's gonna suck now. And if your life was great before that, it's gonna be great now, right? So stop. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, Jason. Is uh, spit it out. Just just relax, breathe, okay. Nothing's going to happen to VA benefits. You're fine. Under a Trump VA, your benefits are fine. I do think, and I would put money on VA disability not changing outside of the VA SRD, right? We have mental health tonight, sleep apnea. We, not, we now have neurological conditions, which is a huge one. We'll have to cover that next week, Jason. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a big one. But those changes are, are going to happen regardless of who's in the White House and regardless of who the VA secretary is, okay? Right. Um, just breathe, man. Breathe. Relax. It's wild that uh, the older generation looks at iPad kids as, you know, uninformed vo voters is what they will call, call them. When I say older generation, it's not uh, specific to one side of the aisle, just older people, even myself, right? Um, look at iPad kids and uninformed voters. I would make the argument of 
older veterans, you know, doing the same thing, <laughs> bro, get off the internet, stop commenting wild stuff. Um, actually read the headline that you're looking at and, uh, enjoy life. That's all. That's really what I want to say to end this video, Jason. Um, what are your thoughts on a Trump VA and disability? And then after that, just go ahead and take it away. Yeah. So, so there's I'm sorry. so much, hey, Clay, there's so much to unpack uh, yeah. <laughs> now that you, the, you went down this road. Um, number one, just to double down on project 2025 is a suggestion. Think box, right? Think tank, regardless of who got elected. Uh, if it was a conservative to be elected, that would have been the same thing. It's not a Trump specific thing. It is a, it's a conservative organization that put together a conservative kind of outline on their suggestions to combat the, um, the budget deficit. We also get that from the Congressional Budget Office. And believe me, if you're not aware, the Congressional Budget Office hammers veterans benefits. Yes, In fact, they year. even said at one point that if your household income was over $170,000, you should get no benefits, no compensation. So that's from the Congressional Budget Office. So these sorts of um, recommendations, if you will, are always going to be floating around, right? It's I don't give too much to it. Sure, it's going to spark some thought, that type of stuff. But back to Clay's point, when you look at the way that it's set up, you have a bunch of elected officials that want to be elected again. And if they don't have the ability to be elected again, they want their party and their successor to be elected again. The first two years are going to be extremely. Um, important for whatever administration is ever in office when they have all three whether it's democrat or republican if you have all three if you have the trifecta you better make sure you're doing the right things and making everybody happy and fulfilling all the promises that you made on your campaign trail mm -hmm. and and also not implement anything that's going to become um detrimental because you want the next two years through the midterms to reflect the same, okay? The same outcome. You want to re retain uh, that control. And again, it doesn't matter if it was, you know, all blue or all red. It doesn't matter. Currently, this is where we're at. It's all red. So that's what's going to want to happen. So do you think for a minute that when you look at the veteran population and look, th these, these people aren't stupid, although sometimes they do stupid things. They're not stupid when it comes to getting reelected and positioning themselves and the chess game of it all. Okay. They understand that veterans are 18 million people, but guess what? There's a good portion that are married and that spouse is just as vested as the veteran. Mm -hmm. There's also a good portion that have dependent children that are either going to, at some point come of age, to be able to utilize some of these benefits like chapter 35 or whatever else it is. And there's also uh, the, the parents of some of these veterans who now become dependents and all of these people are a voting block. So you could take that 18 million veteran count and go, okay, what's a number of those that could potentially be impacted and, and worry about what things are being uh, implemented? as far as legislation is concerned and you could take that 18 million number clay and you could probably call it 45 million 45 million is a no joke mm -hmm. number of people that you do not want to piss off remember i mean look you're you're getting in, in the 70 millions to each person that ran for president 45 million is more than half of either one of those candidates so this is not a group of people that you want to go swinging an axe around and just chopping things off and 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 not having a care in the world you here's the other thing clay and and you'll you'll totally get it and actually everybody should get this but you get it more when you're in government when you create a program or a benefit or anything even if it's temporary it's very hard to take it away. Mm -hmm. 
because all the all the people that put that into place hung their hat on it and now everybody who's benefiting from it wants to make sure it, re it stays there so once you get the whole goal for any any organization that benefits from government uh programs and stuff is to get a program established i don't care if it's a one-year pilot program let's do that because then we'll crush it and then you can't say no because it's done such a great job because oh my gosh if you say no you're going to hurt all of these people you don't want that on your record do you right and so once they give it it's hard to take it away if you will so VA compensation, I don't believe is going to go anywhere. One thing that I do think will happen is the expedited process of uh, changing the rated rating schedule, uh, the rating schedules. The VA, uh, as you all know, is already in process of changing rating schedules. They've been doing it uh, for for I don't know almost ten years now, changing them all. Currently, we're waiting on. Uh, respiratory, auditory, mental health, and neurological rating schedules to be changed. It's not all good. There's some negative impacts in that, and it's starting now. It's not necessarily because uh, the current president. It's because this is what the, the VA is running this, and the VA is getting the medical input and all of that stuff. We can agree or disagree with what they're doing, and, and we do consistently say yeah. we agree with that and we disagree with that. But they're moving forward nonetheless there is a spot where you can put public comments in the federal register and i highly suggest people to do that it's still open for the neurological uh uh changes that are going into effect so take advantage of that um but i i think that clay we will obviously see those changes coming um but i think that we may see some loosening of the red tape to get those changes to happen and in some cases veterans will benefit faster. And in some cases, well, you, you know, you're going to have to just eat, eat the dinner you're given because here it is. Right. Mm -hmm. So for example, the sleep apnea one, um, yeah, if that was an expedited process, instead of it taking four or five years to go through, you know, if in the future, these things might only take a year to go through. So those changes will come more rapidly. Um, so I think we'll see that on the health, on the uh, benefit side. I think that that's really the biggest thing we'll see personally. Um, and then on the healthcare side, I think we're gonna see some more, um, some doubling down on community care and, and easier access for veterans, especially in rural areas. I do, I do think that that will be coming. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna say here, Clay, and then I wanna get your thoughts. I know you said to end it, but, but we have now Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Mm -hmm. coming in as health and human services okay now his viewpoints much like many of our viewers clay look i got shot up on both sides a billion times right who knows what sort of things and and uh ramifications that all of that and we can all agree that we've all had that thought of you know some of this stuff might not even be what we think it is right like some of this stuff might be like testing <laughs> let's test it on these guys because we can right tired you know and i don't know if there's any truth to it but but we've all had that thought and with his stances on on um all of that stuff could we potentially see new studies being formed new um i guess this this is causing this type of things where now all of a sudden we're creating evidence for basically everybody who ever served in the military and oh will he actually look into the military and all the things that are being given to our young men and women and will he also work in conjunction with our new va secretary about maybe an additional uh presumptives right i mean we already have several presumptives that happen just from service alone that happened well after a year of service that if you come down with, for example, Hansen's disease or tuberculosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, these are presumptive conditions simply because you served and who knows what sort of exposures you had. I want to get your thoughts on that real quick. Yeah, no. So this is a big one. And um, I will reveal this. 
if RFK um, won the spot, I, that's who I would have voted for. Okay. Right. On the premise, and I'm glad you brought that up, on the premise of he is really, really into investigating childhood chronic diseases, right? Uh, Jason knows, a few of you know, that's really personal to me specific. And so he had, from day one, I was like, go this guy, okay? Um, and that's relevant because you bring up a great point. Do I think it's possible that he would look into – you know, the immunizations, you know, you're in boot camp, you're walking in a line, you're being shot up, you get the butter, um, the peanut butter shot in your butt, right, which sucks. Um, you do all that. Do I think he'll look into those and other presumptives and um, that? I don't think so, right? I think that's not his focus. Is it possible? Absolutely, okay? I think his focus really shifts towards two things. One, he's very anti-food pyramid. I don't want to get into that too deep. Um, but oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food pyramid about who funded, who who established that. To tell you um, a quick synopsis, it was not medical studies who did that. It was a company paying for medical studies, studies, right? Money makes the world go round. If you want to go on a conspiracy rabbit hole, you know, take what I just said and search that up because it is deep. All right. Um, and then specifically, and that that lends a lot to chronic diseases in kids, which is a huge uptick. I forgot the percentage, but as a nation for chronic diseases, I'm not talking about my kid has a stuffy nose. I'm talking about like polycystic kidney diseases, heart diseases, liver diseases, right? Real issues that kids face. Autism. Every Almost every kid I meet has autism today, which is not... I don't say that jokingly, okay? It's uh that's weird. You know, that it, is it's so scary. Scary. Weird. And so that's really his focus, at least from my understanding. Once mm -hmm. uh once the Democratic nominee stuff went down, right? And he pretty much got shafted. Um, you know, his campaign was essentially over and went in went in he went independent, which is basically like throwing money in a trash can, which is, I don't know why smart people do that. Um, but he had something to say and it got heard and Trump likes, I'm so glad this, this makes me, I'm going to say something and I know people are going to get pissed off. This makes me like Trump because he knows that RFK is passionate and that's what I like about RFK. He's passionate about this topic. I'm passionate about the chronic kidney or chronic diseases and kids. Um, he's passionate about it. He's extremely smart, and he wants change. And although RFK completely disagrees with Trump, and Trump completely disagrees with RFK, um, just the notion of Trump appointing him into the – I forgot what the official cabinet position is called. Health and Human um, Services. Yeah, but uh, just just knowing that he did that with someone he completely disagrees with, and they're going to have arguments – on topics that are outside RFK Jr.'s lane, like energy, for example, right? Um, it, sh it shows me that it's an indication where this administration really, they want what's best. I know that's subjective. That's my opinion. I'm a big RFK Jr. fan. Um, yeah, chronic diseases in kids is bad. But to answer your question, it's possible. I don't think so. I don't think that's his foot his focus i do think I, I, that if it if it's brought to him he'll right. look into it. i don't think yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that it's on his plate right i think there could be some collateral effects right of of whatever stuff because obviously there's going to be studies that are are going to be funded by the u.s government on certain things right so yeah. you can't just feel like this is or think this or you saw a study over here you're going to want to start funding your own studies working with universities blah 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 there's all this grant money that goes out so you're going to be targeting certain things. So what I think is going to happen is, is as that transpires and the results come back, if they come back showing the increased chance is, you know, 73% more likely if you got X, Y, Z, right? Mm -hmm. um, All together at the same time. Oh, okay. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's what I did on boot camp day one. Well, no wonder, right? Now I have a clear more more than likely than not. So yeah. that's what I'm pointing to is kind of those collateral like uh, effects of being able to grab a study that gives that evidence 
as being more than likely then taking that to your doctor to utilize um your doctor for uh for the nexus letter and, and rationale and look if you don't have a doctor out there that will do that for you um or that you, you got to train them up and explain exactly utilize ame uh ame is super solid both of us agree uh you can mm -hmm. use the link below uh ame will take care of it and not only get you what the va is looking for with regard to a nexus letter and rationale they will also provide a dbq if you need it remember two things nexus helps you create our nexus letter helps you create the nexus the link getting you service connected dbq helps you get the appropriate rating so it's kind of a two thing anyway ame super solid check them out they'll be in the uh, comments and in the description back to you clay yeah no that's that's all that's all i got jason this was a super long episode and to be honest you're with you, welcome we can do this you know next week we could take these same topics and do another hour and a half because it's just yeah. so much to unpack here i will say as a reminder and I'm, I'm i'm saying really saying this to you instead of the viewer jason um i do think we need to cover the neurological conditions in depth on a longer yeah. form episode because they are these are big cha changes okay um it's a huge rating huge va srd change um, on the scale of the mental health tinnitus and sleep apnea. But uh, yeah, we'll absolutely do that. My one advice to veterans, if you made it to, to the end, okay, I'm going to leave you a question and I want you to answer this question so that way we know you made it to the end. Also, we love you if you did. If you didn't make it to the end, you won't hear this, but we don't, lo we don't lo lo love you as much, all right? That's a joke. Anyways, here's the question. Do you think the Trump admin, the Trump administration and the Senate and the House um do you think that the guard act and the plus act is back in conversation the reason why i'm saying that and for the viewer you can dig that up before you answer this question in the comments um do you think that's on the floor because naver national associations of veterans rights i think um led by peter o'rourke not to be confused with the previous va secretary peter o'rourke these are two different people um they are buddy buddies okay when you talk about lobbying like from veterans guardian from va claims insider although their lobbying has been cut short a bit because they're a little busy in texas if you're picking up what i'm putting down um but you have naver which has tons of lawyers who are for the plus act meaning claim sharks claim sharks as deemed by the vfw right um do you think that's back on the floor? That might be a, that might be a topic that we'll cover, but I want you to answer mm -hmm. that below in the comments because we I generally there's no way to answer that. We don't know. Um, but yeah, I want to know your answers. That's all I got, J Jason. Awesome. And and since you brought up legislation, one last thing: uh, if Clay gets this thing posted up uh, today, uh, April, April, it's not April, <laughs> no, November, not November. I don't know where I am. November, November 18th, yeah. November 18th, that's where we are. If Clay gets this posted up today, this week Congress is supposed to be voting on the Elizabeth Dole Act. Um, if you support that, uh, call your congressional member's office, let them know that you support it. Swing by, you know, sometimes it might be by your post office as you're running around doing errands. Stop on in. They don't bite, they're super friendly. It's just usually young staffers in there and you know they're trying to get their feet wet and whatever. Go in there and, and uh, let them know that you support it. Imagine for a second if you had a thousand people reach out either by phone, email, or stopping by in person uh, to a congressional member's office. Even, even when the congressional member's not there, guess what? They get text messages and their staffers are going, wow, we had a thousand people come in here about this. Remember how you were gonna vote no? You should probably yeah. vote yes. Just saying, right? So it's those, those little things matter. So if you don't have anything else, Clay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, run us out. No, grassroots efforts absolutely matter, um, especially on issues like small issues like like this, right? I'm saying small sure. relative there. But yeah, that's all I got, Jason. Agreed. All right. With that, thank you guys so much for watching. We appreciate you. Have a great one. And remember, we don't take care of each other. Something went wrong. <laughs>